Welcome back to the Calculated Risk Podcast. We are a day late this week. I apologize. I was sick all day on Sunday when we normally record. And Kelly was gracious enough to push back so that we could both do the show and he didn't have to do it solo. We saw a really entertaining, in my opinion, week week nine. We had some, again, some really important games this time of year. I mean, every week we're just, we're learning so much. The season's taking shape. I mean, Oregon goes into Rice-Eccles and just dominates Utah, which I don't know that anybody really expected. My numbers were high on Oregon going into that game, but man, they they completely shut them down. Uh, Washington, you know, looked mortal for the for the second straight week. Ohio State goes on the road, gets gets a, a two score win at Wisconsin. Penn State struggles with Indiana. I mean, there there was a lot a lot going on this weekend. Uh, Kelly, what were your you know initial takeaways from from Week Nine? Yeah, Tyler. Well, first off, uh, you said I was gracious to, you know, wait a day and not do it solo. Like, dude, never a problem, one. But two, if any, if either of us do this solo, it's not calculated risk for me. Like, to me, calculated risk has to be both of us. So, yeah, it was no worries. I'm glad you're feeling better. Um, that is the most important thing for sure because we're in the middle of a grind, man. It's, it, this season... It's long, but we love it, and it'll be over soon before we know it. So it's it's important to get right, get healthy, and uh, come back strong now. So, yeah, as we recap week nine here, for me, the biggest takeaways, Tyler, is I'm looking at, you know, which teams improve their resume the most. Because at this point of the season, that's where I'm – well, I like looking there all the time. But at this point of the season, that's where everybody else is tending to look to with the CFP selection committee coming out with their rankings. So if I look at my kind of, quote, best wins from the weekend, how about Kansas at home over Oklahoma – that was a huge win for the Jayhawks, um, not just for this year, but just program building. I mean, what Leipold is doing, I've tweeted about this, and I, I maintain it. He is on statue track. Like, it's only been two years, so you can't build a statue for someone after two years. But this will be the first time, I think I saw ever, that Kansas is going bowling in consecutive years. He is doing things at Kansas that it's been a long time since we've seen, at least over the course of multiple years. So, there, by no means is Kansas going to win the national championship this year, but when the program's been as bad as Kansas has been, he comes in and turns things around. Man, Kansas with a great win. Uh, Oregon, you mentioned it. How about that? Going into Rice-Eccles, only the, the the first time outside of the COVID year that Utah yeah. has lost at home since 2018. So just a great win for Utah. They look like a top five team. We're going to get to that here in a second, our updated power ratings. Um, so that was another really good win. And then as I continue down the list here, there weren't many others uh, in that camp that got it done, um, but those those are the two that stood out to me the most about NC State uh, getting the win as well. Sure. Arizona is a new look team. I'll tell you about that uh, down in Tucson. So, yeah, uh, those are kind of the teams that stuck out to me, Tyler. But overall, a really fun week nine, a lot of big games uh, in week 10. Only going to get even bigger as we get uh, closer to the end of the year here. Yeah, yeah, no doubt. Yeah, Oklahoma losing, you know, that was – that was a back and forth. That was a really, really good game. I think that probably ends Dylan Gabriel's Heisman campaign. Um, probably ends Oklahoma's national championship hopes. I mean, they we'll, we'll see. No, but if, they, if, they, they, if they go twelve and one and win the Big Twelve Tower, they're going to be in. Well, yeah, I, I guess technically it doesn't, but I think I think my point is more like in practicality they looked really mediocre against UCF last week out of the bye and then they lose outright so they they just haven't been right really since since the Texas game so I, I would say you know team, Oklahoma and Washington are two teams that I kind of have my eye on is like kind of trending the wrong way right now Washington's had had back-to-back kind of close-ish calls uh with with Arizona State and um Stanford this this past weekend so We'll we'll see. Like no, no, Oklahoma's hopes technically on paper are are not dead, certainly, but they're gonna have to play much, much better football if, if they're gonna have a chance to win the Big Twelve and, and potentially go to the CFP. Uh, with, with that, that though, sure. let's yeah, let's uh let's get into our updated power ratings and and see kind of how everything shook out from a rating standpoint after after this week. Uh you know, we mentioned last week our, our numbers for the most part are, are kind of coming into focus and, and being more lockstep. We do have, we do have some kind of discrepancies uh, you mentioned Liberty. I've got them at number 21. Uh, where'd you say you have them like in the forties? Actually. So from a power rating standpoint, which is what we're talking about right now, power rating standpoint, I have them number 56. So still, still not, you know, a top 
50 team yet for me, but yeah, I see them up there. Number 21 for you. Uh, the flames doing well. Yeah. And they, I mean, you know, that's, that's a team we talked about. My numbers are really high on them coming into the year, which makes sense why we're at this point now with, with the discrepancy we have, but I mean, they've been excellent. Not only have they, you know, they're undefeated obviously, but from a, against the spread standpoint, like Vegas has been too low on them more often than not so far. I mean, they've, they've covered, game after game after game this year, uh, including, you know, blowing out um, Western Kentucky uh, here in the last last week or two. I, all my weeks are running together at this point. But, <laughs> uh, yeah, so Liberty, a team I've been high on throughout. They they continue to, to look good, so hopefully they they keep that up. Um, you know, Duke still hanging around at number 16 for me after getting shut out by Louisville. I mean, they they kind of had some, some room there because they had gotten up so high initially. So, I don't, I don't love that. That's one of those where I'm like, okay, I see which way they're trending. I, if I could make manual adjustments, I would definitely knock them down a couple of pegs here. I, I don't love having them at 16. Uh, L, LSU were, were, you actually have them rated higher uh, by about two points, one spot in the rankings. I've got them number nine. You've got them number eight. You know, as they, they had two Bryant Denny Stadium this weekend and, and the biggest game of the of the SEC West uh, season for sure. So um, so looking at your looking at your ratings, you make that what like Bama minus two and a half or three. Yeah, somewhere in that range, probably two and a half ish, because uh, they have the exact same power rating. Right, I actually have three teams: Tyler, Texas, LSU, Alabama, all with a twenty two point zero power rating. Like when that spat, spat out, I was like, "Hold on, I double checked it. It is right." <laughs> I don't remember a time where I've had three teams, uh, especially in the top ten, that all have the same power rating down or rounded to the nearest tenth of a point football point per game. So, um, yeah, that was interesting. So those two teams very very similar from a power rating standpoint for me. But yes, I would make Alabama with the home field a favorite here. Looking at yours, Tyler, I mean, I don't imagine your home field is almost four points. So I, I guess you've got you're leaning LSU actually win that game outright. Yeah, I've got I've got LSU by a point uh, in this this week. And what's funny is as I'm looking at this, we both have Texas and LSU with the exact same rating. That's that's funny. I mean, considering we round to the nearest tenth, it's it's funny <laughs> that that shook out that way. So models definitely uh, in in alignment on on those two teams, both in in the top ten. Uh, Penn State, I mentioned them off the top. I mean, they they really struggled with Indiana, and I tweeted this. I swear, I, I didn't actually go back and do the research, so maybe this is just like one of those confirmation bias things, but it seems to me that every single year, Penn State just like empties the chamber against Ohio State, and then they lay an absolute egg the week after that, every single year. I, uh, most notably, you know, the, the 2017 game that was – Crazy, 39-38, I was at that game. The next week, Ohio State goes and gets blown out by Iowa, and Penn State loses to Michigan State, and it's like, well, <laughs> all that for nothing. So, uh, I mean, they, they look for a little bit there, like they might actually lose to Indiana this week. They they did pull it out. Uh, it was, I think they it was discovered... tied with two minutes left, Tyler. Two minutes left in <laughs> yeah. the game, the score was tied. It was yeah, crazy. I mean, that, but, but... Um, unbelievable. No, and I, I'm with you. And it's not just Penn State and Ohio State. I mean, you see it across college football week yep. in, week out, year in, year out. You've got these scheduling dynamic spots. And we talked about it before, Tyler. There's things that the model can't capture and account for. Scheduling dynamics, at least for me, is one of those things where you talk about there, there's all sorts of different kinds of games. You've got, you know, trap games where you've just had a big week last week and you've got another big week coming up in a week, but you got that game in between. You got the look ahead spot yeah. where, hey, you know, next week's opponent's a really big one. This week, this one, not so much. And then you've got the the game where where you're caught, you know, either basking in the glory of a great win or letting the opponent that just beat you once beat you again because it's a letdown game after a big game. That's what we're talking about here with Penn State against Indiana. Like, there's all sorts of these things. You got, you know, which teams are coming out of their off weeks versus which ones aren't. Like, so you have rest advantages. Who has to travel across the country? Multiple time zones. Is the is the game on a Thursday night? So does someone come off of short rest? So there's all those things we talk about in the NFL. We don't talk about as much in college, I don't think, and I'm not sure why either that or I'm just not paying attention to those that do. But I think it's really, really important. Um, and yeah, that's something that again, the models aren't going to capture, but viewers of the model, people, yeah. fans of the game who, who who use the models as just one of the tools to, to try to evaluate teams and evaluate matchups, you have to account for these things because it is real. And we see it time and time again across the country, across conferences, every team. 
in some shape or fashion is caught in at least one of these games every single year. So uh, it's human nature. You know, it's not just football. It's not just college kids. Everybody, every day in their daily lives, it's possible to let one bad day at work bleed into two. It's possible to let one great day at work take your eye off the ball the next day, right? So it it happens all the time. Um, But it is definitely interesting in college football, and, and Penn State is a good example in recent years, the game after Ohio State. Yeah, and I mean, if, if you read my work at vsin.com, where I, I publish my weekly college best bets, I, I talk about that quite a bit, the situational spots. And I have people message me all the time like, hey, you your numbers indicate there's a big discrepancy on this game. Why are you not betting it? And it's like, well, they just came off of this huge win. They're in a, a, a letdown spot this week. Like, I don't the, – the model, like you said, Kelly, doesn't, doesn't account for that. But, it's, I mean, especially if you're betting these games, like – putting your money on it, you have to, to factor that stuff in. Um, so no model, you know, is perfect. No model is going to capture all the nuances of the sport. So definitely encourage you to like, look at, at scheduling dynamics, like Kelly said, because that's, that's huge, especially when you're talking about college kids. Uh, back to the ratings. I mean, SMU is a team we talked before we recorded. I mean, SMU is another team that TSI has been crazy high on, like uncomfortably high on uh, at some points this season, but, you know, they, they continue to, to win and look impressive doing so. I mean, they, they hung a 50 burger in the first half on Kevin Wilson and Tulsa this past week, which was like absurd. I, I tweeted, I joked in the first quarter and was like, are they going to score a hundred? And then when they got 52 in the first half, I was like, Whoa, I was kidding. I was kidding. <laughs> they could have so, though, if they kept the foot on the gas. They, uh, they seem to be for real. They're my top rated G five team. So I mean, def- definitely keep an eye on SMU, you know, as, as we evaluate uh, New Year's Six Bowl games for for sure. Yeah, I'm right there with you, Tyler. I've got SMU number 19. They're up a few spots for me. They are the class of the G5 this year. I know in the preseason, I mean, they, they actually were my uh, – they had the highest projected conference win total in the American because their schedule set up a little bit easier than Tulane's. I had Tulane as a better power-rated team. SMU's been in that kind of number one seed spot in the American, though, from the beginning of the year, and they've just strengthened their grip on that for me and my number. So definitely keep an eye on them. As I'm looking at other G5s that I have, none other than the top 30, as you can see on the screen here for those watching on YouTube. But um, after that, I got Air Force at number 38, coming in there two lanes at 44. James Madison at 46, still having a great year, are the Dukes. Troy's at 47, South Alabama number 50, and I already mentioned uh, Liberty at number 56. So those are some of my G5s that are up there. No surprise, talked about it all year. You have a couple more in your top 30, and you're a bit higher on the G5s than I am. Um a couple of those, though, as we talk about SMU Liberty, certainly uh, showing well for the TSI. That's for sure. Yeah, yeah, definitely. They, I, you know, I, I love. I, I bet Liberty against Western Kentucky uh, again. Whenever that game was last, I think it was last last weekday, last Wednesday, or something like that. Those those wins are are huge for the model and and are why you know not any individual game, but the collection of those games you know have have generally gone my way this year, which is really encouraging in terms of, you know, how I'm adjusting my formula uh, every every offseason. So glad to see that, that some of these teams that coming into the season I was high on, uh, you know, that's that's paying off. Now, obviously, there are, are plenty of teams that, that, that goes the other way on and they completely lay eggs and and I look terrible. So it, go, it goes both ways. Uh, like I said, no, no model is perfect, but I, I do I, – I have enjoyed seeing Liberty and SU and some of these teams, um, you know, really have, have good seasons so far. Kansas State, another team playing dominant football right now. Huge one with Texas this week. Texas without Quinn Ewers. I think Kansas State might win. Uh, I know we'll we'll get into that on on the Thursday show, but I I think Kansas State might get it done this week against against Texas, but but we'll see. Uh, Kelly, any anything else stick out from the power rating standpoint before we get into our most deserving resume rankings. I think the final thing, Tyler, and those that are watching can see it. We have the same top three teams in order now. Michigan, number one. Ohio State, number two. Oregon, number three. We both have Florida State in the top five. Uh, Penn State in the top six for both of us. So um, I think at the top, we, we're, we're in pretty close alignment. Again, the, the gap bet- for you between Michigan at number one and Oregon at number three is six points. For me, 
that gap uh, between Michigan and Oregon, one and three, is about four and a half points. So a little bit more of a gap on your side. Michigan, a little bit higher power rated for you at 30.4. They're 27.8 for me. But um, regardless, I think things are really starting to take shape. Oregon is definitely a team to keep an eye on. They've lost their margin of error since they lost on the road at Washington. But they are certainly playing like the best team in the Pac-12 and one of the best teams in the country by both of our numbers right now. So we'll see if the Ducks can uh, finish it out the regular season unscathed to, to, to make it to that Pac-12 championship game. Because if they get there, I think they'd be a favorite. But um, yeah, the, the power ratings at this point of the year, they are what they are. And you say it all the time, the numbers are what the numbers are uh, by this point of the season. They are what they are. They're not changing too much. You talk about some teams trending, but it takes a lot to move team significant distances uh, this far into the season. And uh, yeah, committee unveils their rankings on Tuesday this week. And so I know we're going to talk some resume rankings. It's that time of year. Yeah. Last, last thought on the, on the power ratings. I, I think gun to my head right now, I think Oregon is going to make the playoff. I think, I think we're going to see Oregon. If I had to pencil teams in right now, I would, I would pencil in Oregon, Florida state, Ohio State, Michigan winner and SEC winner. I, I think I think that's the four. Um, obviously, that can all blow up in my face this weekend. I think LSU is going to have again. I project LSU is a one point favorite at Bama this weekend. I think they're going to have a chance to give Bama kind of the knockout blow. Georgia looked really good against Florida this week. How good is Florida? We'll see. Uh, like we mentioned last week, Georgia's got a couple. Real teams coming up here. Um, they play play A and M, which is not going to be easy. They play Ole Miss, so we're we're going to find out a little bit more about Georgia too. Um, so I, I might be singing a different tune on Georgia right now. I'm still kind of in wait and see mode. All right, on to the most deserving and resume rankings. Kelly, I want to I want us to run through our top ten each, and then just kind of give our thoughts on what we think the committee committee is going to do uh you know by the time people are hearing this it'll be within hours of, of when they get the committee rankings so i'll let you go ahead and start us off what's your top 10 most deserving okay you're you're muted There we go. So top 10 here, Tyler. Sorry about that. After week nine, the top two remain unchanged. I've got Ohio State number one. I've got Florida State number two. Washington moves up to number three. I used to have Oklahoma in that spot. We'll see where the, the Sooners tumbled to. Texas up two spots from number six. They are now my number four. Alabama holds at number five. I tweeted about this, Tyler. In the time I've been doing the most deserving rankings, I have never had a gap between four and five this small. The way that I scale this is four always has a raw deserving number of 1.0. Like that, the, the number four team in the country and the most deserving is always 100% worthy of inclusion in the CFP. That's kind of how you can interpret the raw number. So it's always a one. I have never in my time doing this had the number five team have a 0 0.999. That's where Alabama is right now. They are 0 0.999. That is one, what, thousandth of a point behind uh, Texas in that number four spot. So Alabama holds steady at number five. I'm glad this is the first week of the CFP rankings and the first week of November, not the first week of December, because I would really struggle uh, to have two teams separated by that, that, that distance there. Ole Miss up one spot to number six. Uh, Georgia up two spots after their win over Florida at the neutral site to number seven. Here's Oklahoma at number eight. They fell from number three. I still have Oklahoma number eight, though. The AP had them number six going into that game this with Kansas this past week. I don't know where the AP has them now. I, I really don't. Um, but I'm sure I, they're I farther either. down. I'm, sh I'm sure they're farther down than eight, though. It bothers me to the nth degree when teams – that quote lose late and i would say by week nine you're getting kind of late in the year you're like well they have to fall because they lost like that's not necessarily true especially late in the year yeah. let's say let's say ohio state and this is what happened last year too with ohio state undefeated going to the michigan game. let's say ohio state continues to win 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 maybe another contender or two falls around them if ohio state loses to michigan in the last game of the season just because their one loss came in week 13 doesn't necessarily mean that they need to fall behind other teams that lost earlier in the year. The timing yeah. of the loss should not matter. Like it bothers me so much 
that timing yeah. of loss seems to play a factor for so many voters. And, I, and the CFP committee will see, but the AP poll is like, well, you lost late. See ya. Like because Oklahoma lost this week, they drop them way down. It's like, well, sure. They fall a little bit because their resume got dinged a little bit. You lost to Kansas, a team that, you know, the yeah. average top 25 team would have beaten even on the road, but, or would have been expected to beat with a plus 50% win expectancy, but the, and, and other teams around them improve their resumes. Oklahoma's resume is still really good, though. So they're still number eight for yeah. me. Michigan, they're number nine. They fall one spot um, because Georgia jumped above them here. So Michigan's number nine for me. And then Oregon. I had Oregon at number 16 last week. I know the AP had them at number eight or something like that. I had them at 16. Uh, they jump all the way up to number six now because that was a good win uh, on the road at Utah. So that's my top 10. Ohio State, Florida State, Washington, Texas, Alabama, Ole Miss, Georgia, Oklahoma, Michigan, and Oregon. Those are my top 10, Tyler, in the most deserving this week. Interesting. We we are pretty similar on most of these. Uh, I do have a couple of differences in mind. So I'm going to I'm going to run through my top 10 quickly and then I'm going to to add some manual adjustment that I made based on the concept that we've talked about before where head to heads matter if it doesn't affect other teams. So I'm going to I'm going to run through mine and then I'm going to then I'm going to explain a manual adjustment that I that I did make. So Ohio State jumped up to number one. They were number two for me last week. Ohio State with the win at Wisconsin jumps up to number one. Florida State number two. I actually have Michigan number three. And I think this is where so their their strength of schedule is by far the lowest of anyone in the top ten. I'm sorry, anyone in the top eight for me. However, I do slightly factor in margin of victory, and their margin of victory is off the charts, obviously, compared to other teams. So I think that's what's holding holding Michigan up here a little bit. So Michigan's number three, Washington number four, Alabama number five, Texas number six, Oklahoma, Ole Miss, Georgia, and James Madison. Now, what I did because of the way it shook out with Alabama five, Texas six, Oklahoma seven, I reshuffled those based on head to head because the resumes were similar. It doesn't affect anyone else. So I reshuffled that to Oklahoma, Texas, Alabama based on head to head results. So I think that's a fair way to do it. It didn't affect anyone else. I, I gave um, deference to how it actually played out on the field for similar resumes. I would say Tyler that, um, and, and I like that. I like when you're willing to look at the numbers and say, okay, can I make a swap that doesn't affect other teams to honor a head to head? I think that's fair. I would say for yours, dude, to be honest, I wouldn't have made it because it, did, did I hear you right? You had Alabama, then Texas, then Oklahoma. That was the order. Yep. Yeah. So essentially, so essentially you flopped Oklahoma and Alabama. Is that right? Yes. So to me, I wouldn't have made the change because now I've jumped, I've sent o or Alabama down two spots instead of just one to honor that head to head. Um, yeah. so, so to me, I, I wouldn't have done it, but I understand why you did. And it's not the end of the world, especially at this point in the season, but that's kind of my philosophy on the swaps. I, I it's very rare for me to make swaps. Very rare. And I had two yeah. last week because Texas and Alabama were right next to each other with Alabama ahead by the, the most deserving rankings. I said, okay, Texas, you can move ahead of them. That's just one team flipping over one. And I also had Missouri and um, LSU last week. I had Missouri 11, LSU 12. So I said, okay, I can swap those two to honor the head-to-head -head of LSU winning. I can't make that swap this week because Penn State, after their win against Indiana, moved from 13 to 12. LSU, who did not play, fell from 12 to 13. So now Penn State is in between Missouri and LSU. Can't make that swap anymore because I'm not going to reward or punish Penn State for something that has nothing to do yeah. with them. Um, so I kept Missouri 11, Penn State 12, LSU 13. So the team that you have in the top 10 that I don't is James Madison. The Dukes, they picked yep. up another win, but they actually fell in my most deserving. They fell from number 14 to number 16. Uh, Notre Dame moved past the Dukes, as did Oregon. Uh, those are the two teams that, that moved past the Dukes for me this week, and James Madison is now number 16. Still my highest ranked group of five team other g5 teams that i have in the top 30 tyler i've got air force up two spots to number 21 i've got liberty up seven spots to number 24 tulane holds steady at number 25 and those are my g5s in the top 30 
I also have those in mine at, um, higher higher than you. I've got I've actually got Liberty eleven, Air Force fifteen, and Tulane seventeen. So I, I have them higher. Um, but again, those those are the only G five that I have in the top thirty of the resume ranking. So uh, we're we're pretty close on on most of those, especially at the top. Um, and then again, like it, it's just. It's very clear at this point, like our, our formulas are just different uh, in how we evaluate G5s, which is fine and, and honestly makes for a really fun conversation and fun, you know, week to week analysis of like how how it went. So uh, it's really I think it's really cool when when both of our models like this have multiple G5s, you know, especially from a resume standpoint up mm -hmm. in, in the top 30. I, I think I think that adds credence because. And you know, I mentioned my my manual adjustments here on these. I don't ever manually adjust my power ratings, but with the resume rankings, one right. again, that's not my primary focus with my numbers. But two, I try to approach it like, okay, this this is what in theory the AP or the the CFP committee should be doing is like, okay, th these are the resumes. Now let's see if it makes actual common sense. And so that that's the way I try to approach it. And I. I'm I'm pretty comfortable with with how this shook out. I mean, if you, if you wanted to tell me, like I've got Penn State a spot below Liberty. Like if you wanted to tell me, Penn State should be ahead of Liberty. I I certainly wouldn't argue too hard on that. But overall, I'm I'm pretty happy with it. I'm happy that there's G5 representation in there, as I think there should be in in a a, a resume style ranking. So that's what we've got in our top ten slash top top thirty. Kelly, what do you think the committee is going to do on Tuesday? Night? Who do you think the top four are going to be when the committee reveals this on Tuesday night? So we've got a new, we got some new committee members, right? Every year, a couple of people shuffle off and, and new folks come on. So, so we don't know exactly what this committee is going to do, but we know historically kind of what the committee has looked at and what they've done. I, I really think the committee is, is going to have Ohio state number one. I do. I think because, and it, this makes me sick. The committee is going to say, well, they've got two really quality ranked wins. They've got wins against Notre Dame and Penn State. And those are two teams that we have ranked, which actually, Tyler, I want to spend a second on this. The committee always talks about their top 20 record against top 25 and ranked wins and makes me sick. But, but bear with me for a second. Put that aside. How do they know what ranked wins are when they're evaluating the top? Because they go top down. Yeah. So they start at number yeah. one. How do you know that a team's going to end up like if you're talking about, well, you know, so, like a team that's going to end up at number 22, 3, 4, 5, or just outside, if you're debating at the top, hey, does this team have an extra ranked win because that fringe top 25 team? We don't know. The committee hasn't worked their way down the list yet. So, like, when they're yeah. talking about ranked wins, it's it's fair to assume Penn State and Notre Dame are going to be ranked by the committee. So, like, th those are obvious yeah. ones. But what about a team like Oregon State or USC or an Iowa or a Duke or North Carolina, the Kansas State, these teams that are, like, closer to that 20 to 30 range? If you're looking at resumes of teams that have beaten those teams, how do you know if it's a ranked win when you're at the, when you're at the top of your your process as they're going through the voting? That's a question that I have that I've never really had an answer to. But anyway, the committee's going to like Ohio State's quote ranked wins. It is what it is. I think they're going to be number one. I, I think that's where they should be though. After that, I hope the committee puts Florida State number two. I hope they do because I, I think Florida, I Florida State. I Florida State has the resume that would reflect the number two team in the country. The Florida State's going to be in the top four. I think they're going to be in the top three. The question is that everyone's talked about it is, what's the committee going to do with Georgia and Michigan? Like, to that, me... That, that's my biggest question, yeah. If you want to put Michigan in the top four, like, my numbers don't support it at all. I have Michigan number nine, but Michigan is number one in my relative scoring margin. You talk about them being number one in your margin of victory. They're number one in my relative scoring margin. So that's a component of the most deserving. So they're, they're, they are beating teams by more then they, they, they're expected to beat the team. So, so that's good for Michigan. They're also my number one power-rated team. Again, rankings should not be power ratings. But if we're talking about how the committee's thinking about this, they passed the proverbial eye test because this is the best team in the country by the ratings. So Michigan yep. could be there. Georgia's, though, Georgia's not a top four team in either metric, any of my in, metrics. In, so in, right. <laughs> that's so my like, issue. If, they, if they put Georgia in there, they're putting Georgia in there because they're the two-time reigning national champs. They've only lost one game since November of 2020. Like, like that's why Georgia would be in the top four. And to me, I don't buy that. Like I, that's not acceptable nope. because we're ranking teams in 23, not the Georgia 2023. Georgia should not be getting credit for 2021 and 2022. Georgia's accomplishment. They just shouldn't. Now I understand the AP poll is giving them that and that's human nature, 
The committee should not do that. I hope they don't. Ohio State, Florida State, I think Michigan's going to be in the committee's top four because they're going to say they're just playing like one of the best teams in the country. I don't disagree with that, but they don't have the resume to support being there yet. If Michigan State takes care of business down the stretch here against Penn State, Ohio State, and these other teams that they're playing, Michigan's going to be in my top four most deserving. Don't you worry about that. It'll take care of itself. But if we're ranking teams on what they've accomplished so far, they shouldn't be. I think they're in there. And then I think the committee's going to put Washington in there. And again, I have Washington number three, but they're going to look. I don't think the committee is going to put a team with one loss in the top four at this stage in this year because we have right now five undefeated power five teams. I would put Texas at number four because I think they are deserving of being number four, but I don't think the committee is going to do that. I think the committee is going to have Ohio State, Florida State, Michigan, Washington. If I had to guess, that would be the order that I would guess they put them in. And again, I don't have any huge gripes with that. The gripe will come in as it would have come in last year for me. And I know I've gone too long, Tyler, but it came in last year. USC did not deserve to be in the top four going into conference championship game weekend. I think I had them number eight. The committee had them number four. Thankfully, USC lost to Utah. And I say thankfully, not from an Ohio State standpoint. It's really not. It's from a fairness yeah. standpoint. You could have put any yep. other team with Ohio State's resume, and I would have been saying that's the number four most deserving team. It just so happened to be Ohio State. They were number four for me going into conference championship game weekend. TCU was number three. TCU lost. TCU stayed three. I think the committee got that right. Ohio State stayed four. USC, for me, fell from like number eight to number nine. I think for the committee, they fell from number four to number 10. Why are you dropping a team six spots? for losing a neutral site conference championship game, a game in which my power ratings and many others out there, I think Vegas had USC favored. My numbers had Utah favored in that game. So I wasn't even expecting USC to win. Utah, of course, takes care of business. There's no way a team should, and I'm, I'm the one that's out there saying, yes, teams should be punished for losing games. Like that's why you, you can't just have all reward, no risk for playing the game, even though it's a bonus game with a conference championship. Teams should be punished, but they should be punished like accordingly. I'm not going to punish USC for losing to a really good power rated Utah team and knock them a ton when, no, when the teams around them didn't improve their resumes either. I think they fell one spot because I think I had Kansas state jump above them because Kansas, Kansas state got that win over TCU. If yep. I remember correctly with how my numbers yep. shook out, but the committee dropped them from four to 10 to me, that's the committee acknowledging we shouldn't have had them at four in the first place. So that's what I was going to say. <laughs> the, the only, the only way that this becomes an issue for me, if Michigan's in the top four here already is if we get to the end of the year, let's say Michigan blows out Penn State and goes into the Ohio State game 11-0. If Michigan loses a really, really close game to Ohio State, and that's their only loss on the year, and Ohio State goes on to the Big Ten Championship, and Michigan's 11-1 and and their seasons, their regular season is over at that point, I don't think my numbers are going to support them being a top four most deserving team at that point. They could, depends on how the other teams shake out. But if the committee has them you know, in that top four already and they lose a close game, my fear is that Mich they keep Michigan in there and they and another team would be you know kind of get screwed out of that because they didn't drop them far enough after losing that. So if you start too high, and they don't lose enough games to fall down to where they should be, that's where we get the problem. If they lose another game yep. and they fall down like USC did, then okay. But that's where I'd have the issue, Tyler. I've gone way too long, but I have a lot to say about that. I'm sure I'll have more to say about it after we see a ranking uh, and we can go from there. But I feel very yep. strongly about this first ranking because we've seen it. Time and time again, more so in the AP, it but even in the, the CFP, table, yeah. it does. And then they're supposed to start over every every week with a blank slate. And and they actually, they might do that. But if you have the wrong teams up there to begin with, you're clearly misevaluating, by my numbers at least, the resumes to date. Because I start with a blank slate every single week too. I'm just, I'm adding one data point and the bulk is staying the same, but I'm still starting over, but the bulk has stayed the same. Yeah. If their bulk is staying the same and you've got a, a team, an outlier that's in the wrong spot, that has ripple effects down the line when it actually matters in December. Yeah, I'm I'm with you. I think I've I've come around to the I I do think they're going to put Ohio State number one. Um, I I think I'll be surprised at this point if they don't. Um, I I'm with you again. I hope they put Florida State number two. I think they've earned that. I won't have an issue if Michigan is in the top four, like you said. I, I think our, our sentiments here are, are pretty similar. My issue is going to be if they put Georgia in the top four because there's there's nothing from 2023 that justifies putting them in the top four. And I, I, I will vehemently disagree with that. If you want to tell me Washington or Oklahoma or Oregon – are, are up there, I would be okay with that because you can, I think, argue those pretty 
pretty realistically, I, I think there's no argument for Georgia to be in the top four. So I'm, I'm very curious, but I, I do think for sure you're going to see Ohio State, Florida State, and I, I think you're going to see Michigan in the top four, which I don't have a problem with. Like I said, I've got the number three in my resume ranking. They're, they're a clear number one in my power ratings. If they're in the top four, I, I totally get it. Um, but that, that fourth spot, if it's Washington, which I think it probably is going to be, like you said, they're, they're undefeated, but man, they are not looking great the last couple of weeks. I don't know if Michael Penix is banged up still or, or what, but they've got some tough sledding down the stretch. So even if they are number four, I think that's going to work itself out. But, um, yeah, long story short, I think, I think it's going to be Ohio state, Florida state, Michigan in some order. And then I think Washington will be the fourth team, but if it's Georgia, I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to be happy with that because there's no, there's literally no, I, show me a metric that, that has Georgia as a top four team, um, you know, without saying defending national champs. That, that's the only justification there is. And to me, that's not a justification, but we will find out Tuesday night. Uh, so you guys should <laughs> hear this. And then within hours, uh, get to get to compare where Kelly and I are with what the committee did. We'll be back on our regular Thursday schedule. Uh, we'll we'll do a brief, hopefully brief <laughs> recap of of what the committee actually did. Hopefully they didn't do anything crazy and like put Georgia number one because I think Kelly and I both might blow our tops if that happens. <laughs> uh, but we'll, we'll be back previewing week ten. God, week ten of the college football season already here. So we will be back to preview that as always. For Kelly Ford, I'm Tyler Shoemaker, and that was Calculated Risk.